South Korea's real estate market was addressed by the foreign media, as were its low fertility rate and North Korea's claim of another underwater nuclear drone test. So what concerns about South Korea's housing market were brought to light? What do foreign media believe is behind South Korea's record low fertility rate? And how credible are North Korea's claims about its successful underwater nuclear drone tests? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. We start the work week today with a look at stories here on the Korean Peninsula that made headlines elsewhere as well. For this, I have Jaco Switzlut here in the studio with us. Jaco, welcome back. Thank you for having me again. I also have Malene Jensen with us. Malene, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you. Right, Jaco, let's begin with some concerning outlook regarding Korea's housing market. Given its unique Chunsei renting practice, how severe is the situation as shared by Bloomberg? Yes, I, I should uh, sketch a little bit of context first. There are three main ways to get a house in, uh, in South Korea, and one of them is, of course, to buy it uh, with a bank loan. Now, if you want a mortgage, you can only borrow up to about 40% of the apartment's value uh, in the Seoul metropolitan area. And that means you have to put up 60% of it uh, by yourself as a deposit, and that's out of reach for a lot of people. Uh, and so the second way is to uh, get an apartment by paying a big deposit called Jonse. Uh, to the apartment owner, and the John says typically between two thirds and seventy percent of the value of the apartment, uh, and even that's a lot of money, as you can imagine. So people often take out a John say loan from a bank uh, and use that and pay interest on that each month. So the owner then takes the John say deposit and uses that often to invest in something, sometimes even in the same piece of property that is being rented out using a, uh, a technique called uh, gap investing. Uh, and so when a tenant leaves, the landlord has to quickly pay that Johnson money back, uh, which can be difficult if that money is tied up in an investment. So the landlord is always hoping that they'll find another tenant to move in quickly enough to pay the John set to the outgoing tenant. Uh, and uh, the third way uh, is to get um, the third way to get an apartment is to have a, a monthly rent where you pay a, a smaller deposit and a monthly rent. Obviously, the bigger the deposit, the less rent you pay. So John has traditionally been the most common way to rent an apartment in Korea if you're not buying. But last year, for the first time ever, monthly rental contracts actually exceeded the number of John Set contracts. And that means that landlords could have a hard time finding a new incoming John Set tenant to pay the outgoing John Set tenant uh, their money back, uh, which could push owners to try to quickly sell those properties that are underperforming uh, at a lower than expected price, and that could lead to a downward spiral in property prices overall. So Bloomberg quoted the uh, Korea Research Institute for Human Settlements as saying that if John Say prices fall by 10 percent, it could mean uh, that 25 percent or one quarter of property owners will have difficulty paying back those John Say uh, when a tenant moves out. And property prices already fell by 4.4 percent in February alone. Uh, so there is some concern there, and that would have uh, knock-on effects on the construction industry uh, more broadly, because the construction industry is funded by uh, John Say prices. Uh, sorry, is funded by short-term loans called project financing. Uh, and if they can't sell those houses, then they can't pay the project financing loans back. And in January, there are already 75,000 homes that were unsold. So there's a bit of uh, concern, and people are watching that market very carefully to see what happens. Right, we all are. And Meanwhile, Melania, the high cost of housing here in the country was also cited as one obstacle to starting a family in an extensive coverage, I believe, by The Atlantic. Tell us a bit more about that coverage. Yes, uh, so it, it seems that because many um, people in South Korea are struggling uh, economically, uh, especially with finding a good house, um, and especially in Seoul where the um, housing prices are so high, um, it can be a, a factor for motivating people to uh, opt out of children. Um, however, it's only one of the many factors uh, that can be the reason why especially women choose not to get children. Um, another big factor is um, simply that women now, since they have more freedom in society, more economically freedom, um, more um, women are entering the job market, meaning that fewer women are actually interested in having children. Um, this is a subject that is um, a, a worldwide problem, but it seems to be especially strong in Korea, which has caught the attention of a lot of foreign media, um, including my own. Uh, so, uh, it is also related with the growing um, feminism wave in South Korea, where a lot of women um, simply decide that they will 
uh, try to have as little to do as possible with men. Um, and they do this by joining the so-called 4B movement. Uh, and the 4B movement is that women are opting out of uh, dating, um, childbirth, uh, sex with men uh, and marriage. Um, and it can also include uh, um, refusing to wear makeup uh, and in general just uh, choosing female products or uh, products and companies driven by women um, more than men. Um, and this is uh, a very big factor of this um, raging, um, some will call it gender war, but at least a gender conflict that there is in Korea right now where um, we have a growing feministic movement, but also a growing anti-feministic movement. Right, and this is something you covered extensively as well, right, Melanie? Yes. Do you see this conflict like heating up further in the years to come? I'm afraid so. Uh, and right now, I don't think that the Korean government is doing uh, its best to actually get this conflict um, down. Uh, one of the, um, the big uh, problems right now is that the Yoon suk yeol government is uh, discussing whether to close the gender ministry, um, which uh, should be taking care of these kind of problems. So there is uh, right now um, no uh, future uh, future prospects where we will see that this conflict will get any better. Right, I see. Moving on to the political front, Jaco, there was also an interesting uh, piece by the Washington Post on what the U.S. could learn from uh, democratic countries like South Korea about prosecuting former presidents. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, yes, a Washington Post writer, uh, Matthew Brown, who focuses on threats to democratic institutions, uh, looked at the case of South Korea, uh, Israel, Italy, France and Argentina as uh, other doc uh, democracies who have... Uh, uh, prosecuted pr uh, former leaders. Now, uh, having read the article uh, closely a couple of times, it looks like uh, they did a miscount. They only mentioned uh, three South Korean presidents who went to jail and one who was prosecuted um, but didn't go to jail. And uh, I think there was four, by my count, that were actually prosecuted and went to jail. So they, they've done a bit of a miscount there. But still, the big take-home lesson from Korea is that uh, prosecuting former presidents in South Korea has not had the effect of eroding democracy here. Uh, Korea is still a vibrant democratic society and power regularly changes hands from one party to another party through uh, democratic processes. Uh, now one analyst, uh, Ji Young Ri Bom, a lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, who researches East Asian democracies, he said that it may have been possible in the case of Park Geun-hye for politicians to cross party lines and vote for the impeachment because the political party system in Korea isn't as rigidly uh, fixed as it is in the United States. Uh, he also said that having an impeachment go from the National Assembly on to the uh, Constitutional Court could help to strengthen the legitimacy of the vote so that it's not seen as a purely, uh, uh, a purely political process. Uh, so the overall message is that if authorities follow procedure, stick to the law and act in a transparent manner, that uh, credibility can hold firm, institutions can uh, remain and, and structures can survive and, and democracy, democracy can continue to flourish. So right, let's hopefully. Hope for that. Right, hopefully, of course. Melanie, um, beyond politics, there was a rather shocking incident here in the capital city about a drug scheme targeting uh, teenagers. Now, for the sake of our viewers overseas who may not be familiar with this incident, please tell us a bit about it. And also, speaking with your capacity as a foreign journalist, what are your thoughts regarding Korea's fight against drugs? Yes, um, so uh, it is known that at least four people, uh, and the reason why I say at least is because it is uh, believed that it might be part of a bigger scheme, but at least four people uh, have been trying to uh, promote uh, drinks to young students in, uh, in the Gangnam area, which is a more posh part of Seoul. Um, and uh, these uh, people have been um, offering free drinks to the students, uh, telling the students that it will improve their concentration skills. Um, and it seems uh, later that in these drinks uh, there were drugs, um, it was uh, including uh, ecstasy. Um, and uh, some of the students have been uh, taking and consuming these drinks uh, and as a part of the promotion the students had to write the phone number of their parents. And later these um, people who have been promoting the drinks have been actually calling the parents and trying to blackmail some of them by telling them to 
to pay the money or they will say that their students uh, are on drugs and report that to the police. Now, um, the four people who we know have been promoting these drinks, they are all saying that uh, they promoted the drinks without knowing that there was actually uh, drugs inside of the drinks, um, but that they merely had seen um, this job offer of a very uh, high-paid part-time job promoting drinks in the Gangnam area um, and that they therefore took it. Now, uh, the police is taking this uh, very serious. Um, they have already uh, located and found all four people and they will now um, have, uh, have more policemen patrolling uh, these um, education institu institutions in their more educational areas like Gangnam. Um, and what I think uh, about Korea's uh, law on drugs and the fight against drugs is that generally, uh, compared to a lot of other countries, uh, Korea is doing uh, a good job, I would say. Um, if we look at, for example, uh, compare Korea to the United States, which has a very big drug problem, we don't see drugs as uh, much in Korea, neither in uh, the nightlife, just as when you walk around on the streets, uh, you very rarely encounter people um, who are, uh, at least who appear to have been taken um, drugs. Right, hopefully, and we'll continue not to see such people on the streets of Korea. Jacko, also within the academic arena, there have been some foreign media coverage about Korea's call for long-term grave consequences against uh, school bullies. Could you tell us a bit about that and how do such efforts compare to those elsewhere? Yes, uh, as uh, those who have uh, seen the recently popular Netflix drama series The Glory, in which a woman gets revenge on those who bullied her at school years previously, uh, they'll know that uh, bullying is both a chronic and acute problem uh, in Korean schools. Uh, now the, uh, the People's Party power, which is aligned with President Yoon sung yeol uh, they want to make a, a new law which would make Korean universities look at the high school records of uh, applicants uh, to see whether or not they were bullies during their high school days to decide whether or not they should uh, uh, come to that university. And the length of time in which these disciplinary records uh, would be kept may also be extended so that potential employers years down the track can look back and see if their uh, job applicants were, uh, were bullies uh, at school. So this is not yet fixed whether that is going to happen. At the moment it's a proposal based on some uh, public, public consultation uh, that the People's Power Party has done recently. Uh, they still have to have a, a consultative meeting uh, with Pro, uh, Prime Minister Han Dok Su to decide uh, whether or not that will go ahead. But as well as that, there's also some measures uh, not just targeting the bullies themselves, but there's some measures that are proposed to uh, increase the number of places where students who are victims of bullying uh, can get help by making more medical centres uh, that specialise in bullying related injuries and also self-harm uh, and suicidal ideation uh, by making more of them available. So I think that Korea will probably need to have a, a discussion about how long uh, these records should be kept uh, and you know because these th are things that are done when children are minors uh, and generally in most societies we make a distinction between something that somebody does in a minor and what they do as an adult and we try not to let those records carry on too far. So I'm not sure whether this is a, a good idea in the long term but it remains to be seen. Right, it does remain to be seen. Meanwhile, Melanie, I understand there's also been quite a bit of coverage about crypto fugitive Kwon do better known as uh, To Kwon, overseas, having no discernible property here in South Korea. What are the implications of such coverage? Uh, yes, so um, first of all, uh, I would like to um, to say about uh, To Kwon that he is uh, known for having two uh, failed uh, cryptocurrencies behind him, uh, and these like this uh, cryptocurrency business has earned him around uh, 315 million US dollars. So it's quite a lot of money that he has gained um, from um, establishing cryptocurrencies and later on um, deciding to um, to make them go bankrupt. Um, so Do Kwon, um, he has uh, been um, uh, well, the governments in Singapore and in South Korea, as well as the United States, are looking for To Kwon, and he has now been arrested in Montenegro. And both the United States and South Korea has asked to uh, have him taken to uh, South Korea and the United States. Um, however, uh, this new report showing that he has none of the money that he has gained from the crypt cryptocurrencies 
appear to be in South Korea uh, might make it more difficult for the South Korean authorities to actually get Tokwon uh, into the country. Uh, and another contributing factor is uh, that his accomplished, uh, his, um, uh, his um, co uh, co worker, you might say, uh, Daniel Shin, who has been working with him and also made money from these cryptocurrencies, it has not yet been possible for the police um, to, uh, to get his arrest warrant, which might also uh, prove that it can be possible, uh, very difficult for the police um, to actually get a uh, Tokwon to uh, South Korea. Right, unfortunately for those who have suffered losses, of course. Now, on issues involving North Korea, Jaco, yeah. uh, the regime this past weekend claimed to have successfully conducted yet another underwater nuclear drone test. Based on your own coverage of North Korea-related um, issues, Jaco, how probable is this particular claim and what are its implications? Yes, actually, my colleagues and I talked about this on our most recent NK News podcast, released tomorrow. Uh, North Korea says that it's working on this underwater attack drone for more than a decade. Uh, and it says that it will deter all sorts of military activity uh, by the enemy, meaning uh, South Korea and the United States. Now, it seems in the last three weeks there have been uh, at least three tests of at least two different forms of unmanned underwater uh, vehicle. Uh, or drone. And in this most recent test, the one that which was uh, announced in the Rodong Shimun paper on, uh, on Saturday, uh, this drone is said to have swum for 71 hours, uh, travelling about a thousand kilometres. Now, North Korea also claims that it, it successfully detonated a trial warhead. Uh, and exactly what that means, we cannot say. It's a bit too early to, uh, to uh, detect. But it doesn't seem that North Korea actually tested anything nuclear under the water, which is a good thing. Uh, although North Korea did originally claim that this underwater vehicle could unleash a, quote, radioactive tsunami uh, against coastal targets. Uh, now, this uh, weapon is intended to give North Korea what they call a second strike capability. So if North Korean land is hit by a nuclear weapon, that one of these underwater uh, unmanned drones would be able to strike back against whoever uh, and, and get revenge. Uh, and that's supposed to be a deterrent against any moves against North Korea. But whether it's actually realistic, well, uh, Ankit Panda, an American analyst of weapons systems and their capabilities, uh, he wrote for NK Pro that the capabilities and the level of completeness seem to be uh, exaggerated. Uh, and it will probably remain a niche undertaking. And for example, uh, anything that's underwater would be vulnerable to already existing anti-submarine technology. So whether it's manned or unmanned won't really make much difference. Uh, and both uh, the United States and South Korea and also Japan have uh, underwater um, uh, weapons that can attack submarines. So uh, it's vulnerable to those. Uh, and as to this claim of there being an underwater or radioactive uh, tsunami, uh, if there were something radioactive blown up under the water, radiation would spread, but not in a tsunami form. So that's a, a clearly overblown claim there. So in terms of delivering uh, a nuclear weapon to its neighbours, it does remain uh, that the ballistic missiles are the best way to go. And that's probably what North Korea is going to remain focusing on uh, for the near future. Right, and in the meantime, South Korea, Mulaney, for its part, has publicly denounced North Korea's flagrant violations of human rights. And this denunciation was shared by Reuters. What do you suppose is the purpose of Seoul's recent public display of Pyongyang's abuses? Well, I think uh, this specific denunciation might be a little bit uh, symbolical uh, in the way that um, South Korea, um, as well as the United States, uh, are right now... Um, doing these uh, shared um, army drills, which has um, very much angered North Korea. And right now we see these rising tensions uh, on the Korean peninsula um, that uh, might be even rising more with this uh, denunciation. Uh, at the same time, we, we've seen during the Easter uh, that um, Japan and the United States and South Korea has made this statement about North Korean uh, cyber crimes and a North Korean hacker corps, um, which is all, I think, part of the rising tensions that we see on the Kore Korean Peninsula, uh, that North Korea is uh, angry about the shared military drills and um, is already saying that um, South Korea and the United States, States are um, pushing the limit uh, to nuclear war. Um, and this has the denunciation as well as a statement about the cyber crimes might be a way of South Korea to respond to um, the many threats and the many very angry political statements coming from North Korea right now. Right.
On a light note, Jaco, mm. the International Exposition Delegation was recently in Busan to assess the city's prospects of hosting the 2030 World Expo. That being said, first of all, have you been to Busan, Jaco, of course? Uh, not for some years, but I have been to Busan several times, but gosh, it's been a while. I think before, while. The, before the pandemic. I think. Actually, me too. No, I think I went there a year ago, two years ago, two years ago, right? Um, well, anyways, what do you believe would be, Jaco, the diplomatic gains of Busan hosting the World Expo for South Korea as a country? It's a good question. It remains a little bit unclear to me. I mean, you'll remember that uh, the World Expo was last held in South Korea just 11 years ago in 2012 in Yosu. Since then, there have only been three more expos anywhere in the world. Uh, there was the 2015 one in Milan, Italy, uh, the 2017 one in Astana, Kazakhstan, and then there was one slated for 2020 in Dubai, but it was actually held in 2021 and 2022 because of the pandemic. So I don't know why Korea is so anxious to get it again. Uh, and, and not just in Korea, but another city on the south coast. I mean, Yosu is on the south, so is Busan. For Busan, it's a different matter. I can understand why Busan wants to have it, because it wants to raise its standing internationally as a world-class port and a world-class city and to show of its high-tech futuristic stuff. Uh, but I don't really know how much attention uh, the people of the world or companies pay anymore to giant world expos. It seems almost like something uh, of the past a little bit, particularly in the era of uh, high-speed internet. You could just watch everything rather than having to travel everywhere. But world expos are in the same league as other world events like the Olympic Games, uh, the World Cup, the Asia Games, and even hosting uh, a, a United Nations office. So we know that South Korea likes to host as many of these as possible. Uh, because it shows off the nation's prowess and capabilities uh, as a host and an organizer and also as a, a lead or model nation. And in, in terms of that, uh, Busan uh, wants to be the fir first World Expo that has climate change as one of its major or sub-themes, and so that's important. Uh, in fact, the, the theme title is Transforming Our World, Navigating Towards a Better Future. Uh, and Korea plans to financially support developing nations uh, to participate in this expo. Uh, but yeah, Korea's first time to host an expo was back in 1993, 30 years ago this year, uh, in Daejeon. Uh, I did not go to that. Did you, uh, were you uh, alive then? I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, who really remembers the 1993 Tejon World Expo? Who talks about it now? And same with the 2012 World Expo. Did it bring in lots of money? Did it pay for itself? I don't know. I really can't find profit or loss statements on these types of world events, but uh, uh, it's hard to measure. I wish Pusan all the best, and I hope if it does win that it ends up being a great success. Right. Well, I've thought about it. I think I was abroad in, in the year 1993. Uh, Melanie, on a personal level, what are your thoughts with regard to Pusan's prospects of winning the bid to host the World Expo in the year 2030? It's hard to say. Uh, I have been um, participating in some of the press tours uh, promoting the expo and I definitely can say that there is a lot of planning uh, in motion right now. However, uh, as far as I remember, the next expo will be in Osaka in Japan in 2025. Uh, and I think the prospect of having uh, two world expos in two East Asian cities, which are both um, harbour cities and are uh, a little bit similar in culture and taste, uh, they're both known for seafood and such, uh, might be a little bit difficult. I think if South Korea really wants to, um, to host a, a big a world event, maybe they should uh, try with the Olympics instead, because it seems like there are not many bidders for that. Mm. Right, for the Olympics, I see. All right, well, on that note, I suppose we'll end. Uh, Melanie, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. And Jaco, as always, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right, well, that is all the time we have for this edition of Issues and Insiders. We return same time tomorrow, that is Tuesday, with a look in, back in history, that is, at Korea's fight for independence. Join us then.